Distinguished future physicians, welcome to Stomp on Step 1, the only free video series that helps you study more efficiently by focusing on the highest yield material. In this video, we're going to be covering free radicals and free radical tissue damage. This is the third video in my set of eight videos in this section that covers cell injury and an introduction to cancer. So I hope you check out the rest of these videos when you're done with this one. You can see here in the top right corner that I give free radicals a high yield rating of 8. For those of you that don't know what that is, it is a rating scale from 1 to 10, giving you a rough estimate for how important each topic is for the USMLE Step 1 exam. If you'd like to learn more about how that's calculated or how you can interpret that number, you can go here to my website. So free radicals are very reactive molecules which have unpaired single outer electrons. And these unpaired outer electrons can go on to damage cell membranes via peroxidation and damage DNA via oxidation. Free radicals can be generated by a number of substances and processes, including X-rays and UV light from sun, which is going to split water into molecules that have a free radical. You've got drugs like acetaminophen, which can cause free radicals to build up. Poisons like carbon tetrachloride, as well as certain metals that end up in the body like iron. Free radicals are also naturally generated in the body by certain enzymes. In this case, these free radicals aren't bad. We need these free radicals. For example, neutrophils use free radicals during the acute inflammation process to destroy things like bacteria. Normal oxidative phosphorylation in the mitochondria also produces free radicals. Reperfusion following ischemia is another example of a process that generates free radicals. In this case, an ischemic tissue will have a bunch of inflammation which then meets the oxygen in this blood flow once the flow is restored and you end up with free radicals like superoxide being generated. This presents clinically as an MI patient who gets worse after treatment. So you'd think opening back up their vessels and getting blood to the heart would be better, but it actually gets a little bit worse there right after you start treating them because that blood brings along with it oxygen, which is turned into free radicals and causes more damage. So as I discussed, free radicals aren't always a bad thing. Sometimes our body needs that, but having too many free radicals or free radicals in inappropriate locations can cause a lot of problems. Thankfully, we have things in our body that can also get rid of free radicals. Vitamins A, C, and E are all called antioxidants and can get rid of these free radicals. There are also a number of enzymes in the bodies that do the same thing. So here's the pathway that free radicals are created and destroyed. Usually I'm not a big fan of learning pathways because they're relatively low yield and it's the kind of stuff that you forget a day or two after learning it. But this is one of the few pathways that I really do suggest learning because there's a lot of clinical correlations like different immunodeficiencies that tie into this pathway and there are questions on the exam that tend to stem from this pathway. So we're going to try to work towards explaining this, but I'm not going to start with the full pathway because this is probably a whole lot to look at and it's pretty confusing. So I'm going to sort of break it down step by step. Here we've got the basic pathway we're going to be talking about, which is you start with O2 oxygen and that can be converted to superoxide, which has a free outer electron. That can be converted to hydrogen peroxide, which can be converted to hydroxide, OH, and then turned into water. And each step along this pathway adds an additional electron. So moving from oxygen to water adds four additional electrons. So each step adds a single electron. Maybe wondering how we got these steps and it's because these are the process that 
oxygen is turned into water during normal oxidative phosphorylation in the mitochondria when we're trying to make ATP. So this is the process it takes. Now, water and oxygen aren't free radicals, and peroxide isn't really a free radical, but it can be easily converted to some other ones. The key free radicals here in this pathway we're looking at are going to be superoxide and hydroxide. But this is the pathway that you go from one to the other. So normal oxidative phosphorylation does not create free radicals because you will convert all the way from oxygen to water. But if for some reason oxidative phosphorylation is interrupted in some way, that's how you end up with free radicals because you stop the process part way through. So you may be wondering how oxygen is turned into superoxide. And that's done by an enzyme called NADPH oxidase. It's an enzyme mainly in neutrophils that converts oxygen to superoxide. And you can see I put that in red because it's generating a free radical. Superoxide dismutase, or SOD, SOD, is an enzyme that converts superoxide to hydrogen peroxide. And you can see I put that in green because it's getting rid of a free radical. You're going from superoxide, which is a free radical, to hydrogen peroxide, which isn't a free radical. Myeloperoxidase, or MPO, is an enzyme that converts peroxide into hydrochloric acid, or HOCl. And this is also going to be mainly done in neutrophils. So again, that's red because you're generating a free radical. The Fenton reaction is a set of steps using iron that converts hydrogen peroxide to hydroxide. So you're generating a free radical from hydrogen peroxide. Catalase is an enzyme that converts hydrogen peroxide to water. So you're getting rid of peroxide which can easily be turned into other free radicals into water, which is safe. Glutathione is an enzyme that can convert hydroxide free radical to water. And ionizing radiation can convert water into hydroxide, basically by splitting the water. And I'll cover more things about this pathway in other videos, but I wanted to mention a couple clinical correlations now. So a defect in NADPH oxidase causes chronic granulomatous disease, or CGD. This is an immunodeficiency due to the neutrophil's inability to generate free radicals needed to destroy foreign materials. Specifically, this makes individuals susceptible to reoccurring infections by catalase-positive organisms. Most organisms are catalase negative, aka they don't have catalase, which means they have a small amount of naturally produced peroxide, which can be converted to HOCl by the neutrophils. And this HOCl can be used in place of superoxide to destroy phagocyte host material. However, catalase positive organisms make their own catalase enzyme, which degrades the peroxide and prevents this process from happening. So they don't have HOCl or superoxide. Another similar immunodeficiency is MPO deficiency, which prevents neutrophils from creating HOCl. I mentioned what glutathione does, but it's also important to know how you get glutathione in its sort of active state, which is the reduced state. So when you've got Glutathione, which is here is represented as GSH, is in a reduced state. It can act on hydrogen peroxide to convert it to water. And in the process, glutathione becomes itself oxidized. But eventually all this oxidized glutathione would build up. So you need a way to, again, reduce the glutathione. So here is an overly simplified process of getting reduced glutathione. So you've got the pentose sugar shunt here that converts glucose 6-phosphate to 6-phosphogluconate. And that's just the first step in the pathway. 
there's a lot more to that pathway, but right now I'm just talking about this. So that first step creates NADPH from NADP. And then one of the functions of this NADPH is that it's going to help reduce glutathione through the action of the glutathione reductase enzyme. And then in that process, NADPH becomes NADP and glutathione oxidized becomes glutathione reduced. And then you just regenerated the active form of glutathione, which can then go on and get rid of hydrogen peroxide. Excessive amounts of acetaminophen, like that seen in certain patients who try to use it for suicide attempts, is metabolized by the liver into intermediates that bind to and remove glutathione. This reduction in glutathione means free radicals build up and damage the liver cells. The treatment for an acetaminophen overdose is N-acetylcysteine, which is the precursor to glutathione. So if somebody tries to overdose on acetaminophen, you give them N-acetylcysteine and you will generate more glutathione. That brings us to the end of this video. If you liked it and you want me to make more, please like my videos on YouTube and subscribe to my YouTube channel. I won't bore you with the details about search engine optimization or social proof, but just know that even though it only takes you a couple seconds to do those things, it really helps me out a lot.